The question is, what stands in most people's way of achieving their dreams? So it sounds oh. simple, we can achieve dreams and yeah. there's a million books on it, but what do you think is actually the block for many people? Um, I, you know, I have written a book called Quit Your Day Job and Lead the Life of Your Dreams based on my own experience and that of others. Uh, one of my favorite stories, I was on Joyce Brothers television show years ago with a couple of other people and one of them was a, a man in his, he was then in his 80s and just had received his law degree from the University of Chicago. And uh, he, he told, he told uh, her that he was standing in line for registration four years earlier and one of the young people in line behind him said, Sir, um, are you sure you're in the right line? And he said, and I turned around and I said, what line should I be in? And I thought, that is America. That's the essence of America. You, you are in whatever line you want to be in in this country. And uh, he fearlessly walked up and stood in the line and got a, his law degree at the age of 86 or whatever he was. And to me, it, it, what stands in people's way is fear. And, and their, their friends inflicted on them. So one of the chapters in my book has to do with distinguishing between friends and friendly associates. Because when I left the academic world, uh, I had a few friends and I had lots of friendly associates. I learned the difference when I decided to leave because I retained a few friends, but most everybody I did not retain as friends because they thought I was absolutely crazy. They either thought that uh, in a kind of benign way, or they just thought I was, I mean, they, or they just were extremely angry that I was leaving a tenured position. They, they thought that was completely ungrateful and crazy. And I could also see that they were fearful about it. And, and I, knew well, I knew them well enough to know that many of them were envious, wished they could do it, but just wouldn't do it because they were set in their ways. And one of, that's one of the reasons I didn't like tenure because it, once you had tenure, you didn't have to publish anymore. You didn't have to do anything anymore. Uh, and of course, if you're truly motivated, that's not going to stop you. And there were a few people who were unstoppable, but mostly they weren't unstoppable and they just stopped. And to me, that was a crime because I didn't understand anything other than the merit system as you know, something that should rule an academy of ideas, you know? So I, I think what makes people afraid is the fear of being out on the street. You know, it's an image that, that I've had, you know, in the first 10 years of getting into a new world where I realized I wasn't gonna get a check every two weeks regularly. You know, you, you have that image if you were raised by depression era parents. And, and you also have the other image of the wolves at the door. Uh, I remember that one because I, I, I found a quick way around it. Go to the door, open the door, and if you don't see any wolves at the door, then there are no wolves at the door. Uh, but it is, it is an image that pops into your mind in the middle of the night, as, as does the homeless image and many other things. But if you're afraid of images, then you shouldn't be in the world of images. I mean, that's what I do is I create images and develop images and turn them into movies. So how can I let, you know, images that are in my brain control my actions? Uh, you have to learn to overcome that. And uh, so I, I think people have to clearly understand themselves and, and decide on who to listen to. You know, if you truly are a friend and you love somebody, you encourage them to fulfill their dreams. Uh, and I always did that to my students. I always felt like you have a dream and you're afraid of accomplishing it. What if your dream is the most important dream that ever came along in the human race and you don't do anything about it? It was your dream and you do nothing about it. To me, that's a sacrilege. You know, you, you had the dream for a reason. You know, it, it's in your mind for a reason. Either God put it there or it, it was born in your mind from some other source. Why aren't you going to do something about it? Well, because I'm afraid that my father and mother would be really upset and I go, so. This is a hypothetical fear about something that hasn't happened yet, right? Yes. Then why not just do it and deal with the possibility that may never happen at all? And uh, that's, it, it's a matter of knowing yourself. I mean, that's one of the things I talk about first in the book. I was raised on Greek philosophy and what it said over the Oracle of Delphi was know thyself. 
that that's, was the most important piece of knowledge that Plato and Aristotle and Socrates taught. And uh, knowing yourself means you know you're going to be haunted by this dream if you don't do it. I mean, I've had a partner who said once when her movie was in trouble, uh, maybe this is one of those dreams that should never have happened. And I go, that is complete blasphemy. You know, you say that now, but later you will see that that was uh, that there was some other voice talking to you other than your own voice, because you you made this thing happen, and you know you will be proud of that, as she was, and that's, I think. The f simply fear is the number one impediment to people going for their dreams. And it's fear, you know, everyone knows the acronyms about fear. It's fear is about things that haven't happened yet, that may never happen, uh, just like worry. And uh, we all do it. We all have fears. We all have worries. But overcoming your fears is what, you know, valiant people do. It's what, you know, people that you would like to be like do. So why not do it yourself uh, and, and not have to live with the regret, which is the big monster equal to fear that you live with if you are sitting on that proverbial front porch in your rocking chair thinking about the dreams that you had and didn't do. I mean, to me, that's a terrible waste of life to have that happen. Also, stripping away illusions, and you talk about knowing thyself and being comfortable enough to know that if you have to stand by yourself for a while because you've lost the illusion of some of the friendships or peer group that you thought was going to be there with you, if for whatever reason socially they've gone the other way, knowing that that's okay as well. Yeah, I mean, th that's a very good point because I think as you get older you realize that uh, you cannot govern your life by what other people think. And it's, you know, I live on the 11th floor and I look out over the millions of lights in Los Angeles. And it's a great comfort to think that there are, you know, a few lights out there that love me. You know, there are maybe fewer that hate me. and But there are millions that have no idea that I exist. That's comfortable. And it's sort of the cosmic view of life when you think about it. You're, you're just one little tiny piece of a massive co cosmos that is going about its massive me mechanism with on its own without any need for you to consult with it. And uh, for you to be worried about what you know, some other person somewhere else thinks about you is a complete waste of your energy in every way. Your job is to do what your dreams tell you to do and uh, to do it with all your might, the way the cosmos does. And what other people are saying and thinking and doing, first of all, because most of them are not spending any time thinking about you at all, could care less what you do or don't do. Most of them are thinking only about themselves. So that's a natural condition. And why should you be any different? You know, if you have a dream, just do it. And if you're the, the crazy painter that has been turning out paintings in the garage, down the street and everyone thinks you're a crackpot, but then they learn that you sold one of your paintings for a million dollars and now it's gonna be in the Louvre, you know, suddenly they go, I always knew that that gal was a genius, you know, she she really had talent from the very beginning. People change instantly, which shows how much value their opinion really has, right? And uh, that's why I just think it's, you, you've gotta really listen to yourself and, and not listen to everybody else. And the few people, you can tell your friends because the ones that support you in doing that are your true friends. <clears throat> and if the person who's not supporting you is, I've had several clients in my career who, whose spouses did not support them. And uh, you know, my advice is divorce your spouse, I'm sorry. You know, like, I take this seriously. I take, <coughs> this is a profession, this is a vocation. And if you know, someone close to you is telling you don't do it, it's selfish. Um, you need to get somebody else close to you, you know, who will encourage you. Because all the all the monumental great things in life, I think, are done by people who go for it and who are not afraid of taking a chance, and who are therefore supported by a few true friends, you know, or loved ones who tell them to do it. You know, it's I have many examples from my own life, but. Uh, when I decided to leave the tenured position, my daughter was a junior at Columbia. And one thing that would be jeopardized 
would be her senior year at Columbia. And I brought her up to Montreal where I was shooting movies and we had a long talk about it, you know, offset. And uh, she said, Dad, you absolutely have to do this. You have to do it. Don't worry about that. And of course, that problem got solved and didn't end up being a problem, but I was a concern. But she had no concern for it. And um, that's how I know, you know who my true friends are. And that's how you would know, too, if you decide you want to do something. Listen carefully to what the people around you say. Because when people are telling you no, they're expressing their own fears. And some of it may be good-hearted. They're, they're afraid that the things they fear may happen to you. But if you're willing to take the risk, you know, don't let them influence you because they're not taking the risk, you know, un unless they depend on you. And then you have to figure that out. And I, and I did certain things when I left that career to make sure that those who depended on me would not, you know, end up being left without resources. So I did what I had to do to make sure that happened. And then once I did that, I, my, my conscience was clear and I was able to embrace it fully with all the risks that it entailed. And I, you know, no regrets, even though there were some very dark times. Uh, and, and there are always ups and downs in, in, in a business like this one and in a career that is uh, bereft of security. You know, the, the other side of that coin is that as much as security is an illusion, Rejection is also an illusion because you, you can take as many chances as you want. You know, I constantly hear people tell me, even on the phone this morning, you only get one shot. That was a distributor telling me, we only get one shot. And I thought, well, okay, maybe that's true for you, but I get as many shots as I want to take. And Hollywood is, you know, first of all, doesn't exist. What is Hollywood, right? It's just a concept. But in reality, the business that I'm in all you have to do is tell somebody, I've got a great new story, and they are all ears immediately. They don't care that it's been 10 years since you talked to them. You know, you, you spend a few seconds in chit chat, and then they want to hear the story. So you can take as many, ch you know, as many chances as you want to take, unless your own psychology disallows that, because it wants you to get depressed and, you know, spend, go into a coma of, of unhappiness and, uh, take rejection seriously, et cetera. I just don't have time. You know, one of my essays is called The Waiting Room, and it's about what you do while you're waiting for an answer on a creative project. Well, you don't wait, you do something else. You know, you, you make another creative project, you get it going. And by the, you know, if you keep doing that, every project has its own clock. You can't do much to control that clock, but you can be doing another project. And, and sooner or later you have projects all around you that are in various states of, of, of ripeness and they will happen in their own time and your biggest problem will be what if two of them happen at the same time and I always say don't worry about that I mean that's the kind of problem you want to have you, you don't want to have the problem of nothing happening so no you don't wait at all and I think a lot of writers torture themselves because they wait you know they, they send off a manuscript hypothetically into the snail mail, no one does that anymore, but they send it off and then they wait for an answer. Why would they wait for an answer? That's a complete waste of time. Instead, you instantly work on something else. And that way, when something comes from the first thing, you're, you're surprised. And you're, you deal with it immediately without wasting any kind of psychological energy on it. You just, if it's a rejection, you take, take it and you move on. And if it's a if it's somebody offering you a deal, then you consider the deal. But you don't, writers feel like they have to spend an additional 90% of their time fretting over it all, analyzing it, you know, soul searching over it. And you do that when you're younger and it's fine to do some of it because you may get a lot of creativity out of it. But once you've gone through it and tortured yourself, you know, to your own satisfaction, you don't have to do that all the time. You can just go back to work. And Ray Bradbury used to say that to writers, get back to work, it'll get rid of all these moods you're having. You know, and I always thought that's the most brilliant advice, work is the solution.